Hello everybody, does this, this sound right? Can you hear me all? Yes. All hear me yes. even? Yes. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yes. Hello, that's a post, wait for the post to arrive. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, bye. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to the uh, Record Cafe. Um, as part of our ninth birthday celebrations, nine years, uh, we've got a extra, there we go, yeah. and we've got an extra special sporting lunchtime lecture with the one and only Dr. David Pendleton, the sort of founder of the sporting lunchtime lectures, I would say. Um, and he's here today in case you didn't know. I mean, if you didn't know this was happening, it's a series of pre Bradford City lectures on uh, sport, hence sporting lunchtime lectures. And David's here today to talk about uh, baseball in Yorkshire in the 19. 30s, which to me sounds intriguing, and I think we'll probably all leave knowing more about baseball in Yorkshire in the 1930s. So here you go, David. Yes, okay. well, <laughs> Thank you. Every talk starts somewhere, and we will, by the way, we'll put all these images online when, when Joe uploads the YouTube videos, but if you can see that, that city stadium up Megram's Lane in Bradford, I was, uh, I was born about half a mile from there. My great-grandparents used to live half a mile from there, so there's an awful lot of personal history in there. But it's a really interesting photograph because it kind of has... This talk's all about perceptions. It's all about stereotypes because that's how we see the world. There's a game of baseball which, to our stereotypes and perceptions, will be about Americana, it'll be about modernism, it'll be about uh, quick play, it'll be about uh, democracy. And the backdrop to that is industrial Bradford, and a forest of mill chimneys which brings forward into our mind's eye uh, Victorian blackened mills. So it's almost it's like two different worlds juxtaposed on each other. Not that, of course, baseball in America will have definitely been played against the industrial backdrop, but it's that interesting juxtaposition of, of industrial Bradford and, and the game of baseball. It's like modernism on, on the Victorian landscape. So it's that picture that, that kicked me off on this little journey of, of trying to discover just what the hell's going on in this picture. This is 1937, by the way, or thereabouts. And I discovered this world of professional baseball in 1930s Yorkshire. But of course, as ever, there's a, a much larger story. And we've got to give you a little bit of context to start off with. So baseball in Britain, of course, I'm not going to get into the arguments and discussions about whether baseball is actually an English game, because it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly it's popularised in America. Um, the father of American baseball, it says so on his tomb, by the way, he's the father of American baseball, was born in Sheffield. Harry Wright, he, he travelled across the United States as a young boy, and he played cricket initially. His father was a professional cricketer in England and in America. Because got to remember the first ever international cricket game was between the United States and Canada in New York. So he was playing cricket and he saw a baseball game taking part in the adjacent field. He took the game up and became one of the greatest players of all time. And he's a really significant character, is Harry Wright. He is, he played in the first game that charged for admission to a baseball game in the United States in 1858. He was the, in 1863, he's the first player who was paid openly now, the word open is really important, of course, there, as we know with uh, professional sports, there's all manner of backdoor payments. In 1869, he's a member of the first all-professional baseball team in America, and in 1875, he plays in the first ever professional baseball league, and the, the, the National Association is probably the first professional sports league in the world, and the football league definitely takes its lead from baseball, but we'll get to that in a, in a very short while. By the way, there is another father of baseball, uh, a chap called Henry Chadwick, a sports writer, statistician, and historian. He was born in Exeter. There's a lot of Englishmen, apparently, who are, who are the fathers of baseball. So he organises an 1874 tour to Britain. He sends a fellow called Albert Spaulding ahead of him. He's another chap who will appear in the next slide, actually. Albert comes across, he's got a letter of introduction to the MCC in London and he organises this tour. And this tour is really closely associated with the game of cricket. All the games take place on cricket grounds. Places like um, Lords, The Oval, Bramall Lane, and Old Trafford. So it's a big tour, but it's really a failure. It loses $3,000, which I imagine in today's money, that's an awful lot of money it's lost. 
And it was Harry Wright's idea, it was his romantic idea of bringing baseball back to his native land. And it didn't really work. It's one of these, it's, it's, it's almost the circus comes to down and then quickly leaves. It's a, it's a curious event that people might turn up to, but it leaves no real lasting legacy, except it does. Um, because just the other day when I was doing more research, I'm writing an article at the moment for Sporting History Journal about baseball in 1930s Yorkshire. And I've just come across a piece that somebody's claiming there was a baseball team started in Leicester in 1876, which is the oldest, which would be the oldest club in England if that's true, uh, based around workplace provision, which is something we'll get to quite often, workplace provision is a big thing. So I mentioned Albert Spaulding. So Albert's already built up a network of people in Britain when he came across the 1874 tour, and he decides to organise another tour to Britain. Albert's a split character. Um, he's a, an, a baseball evangelist. He thinks it's the greatest game in the world. He wants to spread the gospel. He also is a, a massive supplier of baseball equipment, clothing, bats and balls. So if it does take off in Britain, he's the man well placed, of course, to cash in on this one. And they, the tour is kind of... It's representative of the transnational nature of business as well. So there's an exchange of ideas between Britain and America that's happening all the time. Both countries export and import goods. Both countries import and export their goods from each other. There's a very large linkage between the two countries. And part of Spalding's tour is illustrative of that because they use Pullman railway carriages on the Midland Railway. The Midland Railway based at Derby, they've got heavily involved with the, with the Pullman cars. They introduced Pullman car trains into Britain. It's a height of luxury. And by the, by the way, the first ever Pullman car train travels between St Pancras and Bradford Foster Square which probably tells you an awful lot about how important Bradford was in the 1870s and 80s. So they travel around Britain on this Pullman car train. It's essentially a, a hotel on wheels because they use the sleeping cars as accommodation. They travel, it's an extensive tour. They turn up at Bradford Park Avenue on the 20th of March, 1889, an exhibition game between Chicago and all America. Now, it's the 20th of March. It rains, at one point it snows. It's not a great exhibition because it's not been played in great conditions. A thousand people turn up, and apparently the, the Bradford Observe even says, shockingly, that some people appear to know what was going on. <laughs> Astonishing. Some people actually understood the rules, can you imagine? So, let's move on a little bit. So, this does actually leave a legacy, unlike the other tour that left no legacy. It does actually leave a legacy because Spalding partly finances a professional league in Britain. And in 1890, he makes, one of his key people he, he, he makes contact with is William McGregor. William McGregor is the chairman of Aston Villa and the chap who founds the Football League. Now, when he founded the Football League, there's an academic argument going on whether the model he took was county cricket or baseball. Now, county cricket, the MCC wouldn't even countenance having a league system for years. They wouldn't have a league table because it was too much like, too vulgar. It's almost professional. It, it's the, the press started producing a, a league table. And then when you get to, eventually the cricket, you have to bear, they have to say, okay, we'll do that. But it's professional baseball right from the get-go. They have organised uh, fixtures, they have, they have a league table, so it's it's from that that McGregor takes his model for the Football League, at least in my view. I'm going to try and find, I'm going to try and do a bit more research on this and try and actually find if I can get to the box. Albert Spaulding's papers are all in New York. Luckily my daughter lives in New York now, so I'm going to nip across there. Whilst I'm going to see, I'm going to nip into this archive and see if I can find something. So a 14 professional league is set up in 1890. They're all, well not all of them, three of them are around football clubs. Aston Villa, Preston North End and Stoke City. The other one is Derby, but it's not Derby County. It's Derby, it's a, it's a fella called Leo who's um, an industrialist. He sets up an, um, a, baseball, a baseball stadium next to his, own, his works in 1889. It's, it's probably the first purpose-built baseball stadium in Britain. And it's all about, he goes to America and he sees provision for workers, and it's usually baseball in America. And he decides it's a good idea to have his, his workers have a stadium. It'll keep the workers fit. It'll make them more productive. So he builds a stadium. So the Derby team is not Derby County. It's Derby. It's a completely different team. But they do use Steve Bloomer as an attraction. Steve Bloomer is Derby County's most famous player. He played for England. He was an, a sensation in the Victorian era. And he comes and plays baseball for Derby. So it's a, 
It's this idea of trying to attract people to this new game by using um, the, the fame of, of existing sports people. It happens again in the 1930s with a rugby league in, in Yorkshire. But that's Aston Villa. You know, last one season, by the way, the, the professional league, they all fall out with each other. Um, run the wrong way. However, in the early 1890s, there is a, a semi-professional league breaks out in the Midlands. And Dar this is Derby again. Um, play alongside Nottingham Forest have a team for a while as well and the baseball ground gets established and eventually Derby County move into that same baseball ground but it's, in, it's initially it is built as a baseball stadium hence the name we probably a lot of us will have been to the actual baseball ground won't we so moving on through my little cards There are a couple of games, and there are a couple of, um, the New York Amateur Club come and play a game in, in the sort of late eight, uh, 19, 19, 18, somewhere on that bit, sorry, before the First World War, 1912, forgive me. In the First World War, there's an awful lot of baseball played in England. The reason for that is because in 1914, the Canadians turn up in big numbers, because Canada in, in 1914 wasn't an independent nation, so when Britain went to war, Canada went to war. And there was an influx of hundreds of thousands of Canadian troops into this country. They were massive baseball players. And they're, they're kind of unseen people in this debate where people talk about the Americanization of British culture, which is, comes along with baseball, particularly in the 30s. And yet it's the Canadians who, who even have the bulk of the 1930s games. So there's an awful lot of Canadian people are playing baseball in Britain during the First World War. And of course, when the Americans joined in 1917, even more people arrived in this country who are playing baseball. There's a lot of games played, but they're exhibition games. They're fundraising games. One of the ones I found at Scarborough Cricket Club is played in 1918 for the Sailors uh, Orphans War Fund. So it's an exhibition, but it's a fundraising game. So people would have turned up to support the fund. They would have turned up to watch a curious new game. They might have turned up also to show support for their allies, to support the Canadians, the Americans who were over here fighting on our behalf. So, but, after the war, it just goes. And the same thing happens in the Second World War, by the way. Exactly the same thing happens. Oops, jumped on too many there. There we go. And other exhibitions, games roll up in the 1920s. This is uh, Goodison Park, 1924. It's uh, the Chicago White Sox narrowly beat the New York Giants. And Dixie Dean, Everton's famous player, plays a walk on part in the game. It's there, he's there to attract the crowd. Um, so it's baseball understanding that they need that local celebrity to try to get people through the gate and then try to get them hooked on the new game. I forgot to mention actually that there is a, 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 an amateur league in Middlesbrough in the same period, in the sort of 1918-1920 period, and it's the same thing. It's an industrialist who goes to America, falls in love with the game, and brings a very small-scale semi-professional league back to the town of Middlesbrough. But it's just that Middlesbrough itself doesn't go anywhere else. But it's the 1930s that is the big, big change for, for British baseball. This is the moment. And this is basically what this talks about. So in 1933, Sir John Moores of Littlewoods. Littlewoods pools. The pools was massive. Anybody under the age of 40 would probably think, what's pools? Um, it was enormous. It was the National Lottery of its day. It was bigger than that. It was a cultural thing. You'd have the television on and you'd see one, two, three down the side of football fixtures. You know, one for a home win, two, was it two for a draw? No, two for an away win, three for a draw. I remember being offended. Remember the pools panel? Uh, if there was too many games called off, the pools panel would say, I remember watching a game, I was sat at home, sorry, I didn't see the game. Yes. But obviously it should have been playing, I can't remember, I'll just invent somebody, it should have been playing Rochdale at Valley Parade. And it said, away win. I was horrified. Away win. Away win. Away win. I was disgusted by the pools panel. So John Moores is friends with um, the head of Major League Baseball, John Hadler. John Moores is traveling a lot to America. He's based in Liverpool. He's got a lot of transatlantic connections. He's a friend of John Hadler, and John Hadler bets him, a friendly bet, I bet you can't set up uh, baseball, establish baseball in England. And John Moores, being an extremely wealthy man, has watched this space. Yeah. Oops, jumped from across one again. There we go, that's John Moores, and that's the picture I was looking for. So he sets up an 18-team Liverpool Amateur League in 1933. That's John Moores, by the way. Looking very dapper. Looking like he's on his way to either shoot some wildlife or play, play a round of golf. Um, so he sets up the 18-team Liverpool Amateur League. It's a great success. 
fabulous success. So he looks to he, sort of, he looks to spread this. He sets up other leagues in London. I'll put my glasses on for a second, I'll forget that. In London, Birmingham, Manchester, Oxford and Glasgow. Amateur leagues are separate in 1934. And that gives him the idea to make the great leap forward. He decides to go for a professional league. And he decides initially to make it the Manchester Senior League. However, at the last minute, Swinton drop out. So this league is based around Greyhound stadiums and rugby league stadiums. Swinton drop out. Who do, they, who do they invite? They invite Bradford Northern. And I think they invite Bradford Northern because, well, I know why they invite Bradford Northern actually. Charles Lamb is the secretary of Bradford Northern. Charles Lamb is, he's helped set up the Bradford Cricket League in 1903. Charles Lamb is also the secretary of Bradford Northern. He's also the assistant manager of Greenfield Dog Track. So socially, he would have been in contact with other people from all of these Greyhound and Rubber League stadiums in Lancashire who were about to host baseball. And I guess that's why they made the invitation. Plus, Bradford to Manchester is a real, relatively easy journey. Uh, but not in 2023, not by train. <laughs> 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 We've cancelled today, haven't we? <laughs> Thanks. 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 Yeah, so it's a rel relatively easy journey. Probably in the 19th century, it's easier. <laughs> So you can see why Bradford get invited to, to become the, the next team. So the Manchester Senior League has changed into the North England Baseball League. You can't have a Bradford team and call it a Manchester League. And the first game of baseball in Bradford, well, after the one in 1889, of course, is between Manchester and Liverpool, Odsall Stadium, on the 1st of May, 1935. Again, these pictures will be put online. It's a fantastic photograph. That's Charles Lamb, the chap, second from right. And there's a big tip with some steps behind it. That's Otzel Stadium. Probably looks a bit like that today, doesn't it? Um, so the, the uh, American, one of the American, somebody from the American embassy turns up to uh, formally pitch off the game, and there's a commentary all the way through. And this sets the scene for the season because every game there's somebody doing a commentary, telling the fans what's happening. So they're building the knowledge of the sports, helping them understand the game because. Well, I'll get round to that. This in a moment, actually, about the differences between cricket and baseball. If you're brought up on a on a cricketing background, oh, well, I'll get onto it now, actually. So, cricket <laughs> is a game dominated by the batsman. The unusual thing in cricket is a wicket. So, most of the time, the batsman will score or will miss. In baseball, it's completely the opposite way around. The unusual thing is a home run. So, the pressure is actually on the pitcher because if he cocks up and the home run gets it, everybody remembers that part. It's like the batsman, if you get out, you get out. The bowler can bowl 10 bad balls. If the ball's one good one, you get to remember that one good one. So it's a complete opposite. So if you don't understand the game of baseball, you're watching playing and missing, and thinking what's happening. So from a cultural point of view, that had to change, and a part of that was to, to explain to people what actually is going on, and to get them some understanding of what's happening during the game. And it's relatively successful. Bradford Northern Baseball Club in 1935 attract between three and 5,000 people for every home game. It's one of the best supported clubs in the league. And they make money, which is unusual as well, apparently. <laughs> so John Moores props the league up. So John Moores, by the way, pays for all the equipment. So John Moores pays for amateurs and professionals. He really does put his heart and soul into trying establishing the game in the north of England. And Bradford finished the season in second place to Oldham which is a good finish. So, you, so, so John Moore's now is thinking, how to expand this? They play a game at, at Leeds between Yorkshire and Lancashire in 1935. Again, it's this idea of spreading the gospel. It holds a meeting at the Mechanics Institute in Bradford City Centre, then one at the Griffin Hotel in Leeds, and the idea is to spread this league and, and invent a Yorkshire baseball league, a professional league, based on the same model as the Manchester Senior League, or rather the North England Baseball League which is around Rugby League and Greyhound Stadiums. And initially, it was going to be all Rugby League. So the teams who show an interest... So ignore that one for the minute. The teams that show an interest uh, in, the, in the Baseball League are... If I can find the right card. It's a problem with right cards, don't you? Put them away and get them in the wrong order. There we go. There we are. So the teams who put in for this um, league are Leeds, Huddersfield, Halifax, Castleford, Hunslet, Hull, York and Bradford. All based at rugby league grounds. Now, the three clubs you've got to watch out for on that list are Leeds, Huddersfield and Halifax. Leeds, Huddersfield and Halifax are part of a multi-sport location. Back to back grounds at Headingley, Fartown and Front Hall. They are intimately connected with the game of cricket. 
that they are part of the football, cricket and athletic club. Bradford Park Avenue was the same, but of course Bradford North are not playing there, but they're part of the same, so it's the same people, same committees. So when somebody tries to bring a summer-based bat and ball game into Yorkshire, which of course already has its own summer-based bat and ball game, guess what, it runs into opposition. Because people say, oh, hang on a minute, hang on. This John Moore's character's got a lot of money. And it seems berserk that they would actually even consider it a threat because Yorkshire in the 1930s won, I think they won six or seven county championships. The Bradford Cricket League was probably one of those, well, it still is one of the best in the world, but at that point was really motoring along. Why is, why is there opposition to this? I think it's because of the spread of what, what was perceived as American culture. In the 1930s in particular, the cinema is absolutely enormous. Talk is appeared in 1929. By 1937, 20 million people are going to the cinema every single year. 20 million. 41 million is the population of Britain. So that's an enormous amount of people. Of course, there'll be a lot of people going more than once a year. And the physical evidence that is there today in the audience cinemas, the super cinemas, the world that's organs coming out of the, um, out of the stage. It's all about modernism. Hollywood movies were a massive part of that. And in, people thought that this Ameri spread American, American culture was, it was upsetting the, the natural order of things. It was challenging people's stereotypes. It was more de democratic, it was more free speaking. It showed emotions in public, for God's sake. So that's why you get the opposition. Because, there's, because it, it's that creeping Americana, and I think that spread, well, it definitely spreads into sport. So the Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Baseball League faces a real crisis before it's even started, because Leeds back out, Huddersfield back out. Then there's a, a letter in the newspaper from the Yorkshire Cricket Council saying that Halifax should back out. When Halifax back out, all the rest, it's like dominoes, the rest go, and they all say, okay. Then suddenly Bradford Northern, who had made money on their first baseball season, said, oh, we need to relay the pitch. Well, they may have needed to relay the pitch, they may not have done. So suddenly they had to find a new place to play. And Charles Lamb, who I mentioned earlier, who was the secretary of Bradford Northern, was also the manager of Greenfield Dog Track. And this is where the pivot comes. So they changed the league to, to being around dog tracks. So if we look at this list up here, again, I'll put this online later. City Sox, Bradford there, the one off the, at the start of this talk, there up at the, um, the dog track at City, at City um, Stadium. Dewsbury Rolls remain a rugby league club. They stay up front at um, Crown Flat. Uh, but they're a very small club, Dewsbury, and I think that, that we're looking for some additional income in the summer. Greenfield Giants, that's who Bradford Norman become. They go to the dog track at Dudley Hill. Hull, now they do play at rugby league ground. They play at Craven Park. However, Craven Park is also a dog track. And crucially, in the 1930s, the, dog, the, the ground was owned by the ground stadium, uh, the ground people. Leeds Oaks play at Ellen Road Dog Track. The Scarborough Seagulls, they're the odd man out completely, geographically and everything. Scarborough Seagulls play at Seymour Road at the football stadium, which is now not, no longer there, of course. I think that baseball fancied the idea of a summer holiday. It's a bit like cricket. You know, cricket goes to Scarborough Cricket Festival and it's cricket and holiday. So I think that the thought, the idea is all the people who supported these teams would go to Scarborough for a day out. So it's good for Scarborough themselves, and it's, and it's, it's probably good for baseball. The Sheffield, Donspur, Oglerton, Dog Track near Hillsborough, and the Wakefield Cubs play at Bellevue, which again is another rugby league ground. So it isn't across the board that rugby league collapses in the baseball league, but I think it's the ones who have very intimate ties with cricket clubs. So away they go in 1936, and, it, and most of the teams, by the way, have rugby league players playing in them. They're using the players as local celebrity to try and get people through the door. And this is a Greenfield Giants, a lovely uh, picture. By the way, Project Cobb, if you go online, there's a, there's a put Project Cobb, C-O-B-B, in, in, into your internet browser. They've got a fantastic archive of British baseball, and they've kindly allowed me to use all these um, images today, which is thanks to them. And it's a, if you want to learn a lot more about it, that's the place to go. Uh, that's a great programme cover of the uh, Greenfield Giants. By the way, that's a generic programme cover. They just changed the colours and changed the name on, on various things. So it's used, the league is using a central source of funding, which is probably uh, Little Wood's Pools, of course. And that's the Greenfield Giants. That's a fantastic picture of the stadium, which is up, um, well, it's, it was, up Cover Heights Lane. Uh, the Morrison's distribution depot is on the site of it. 
number of few years ago, we did a, a vintage bus trip around the Lost Sports Grounds of Bradford. We went there, there's absolutely nothing to see today. But it's a lovely stadium, actually. Um, really nice. And they played there for two years. This is where we started this talk across. This is the, uh, the, the dog track up uh, Legrams Lane. My auntie worked on the tote there. I asked her if she could remember the baseball, but she couldn't. Uh, but it's, she's 95 and it was a long time ago. But she said, she said, she thought my dad would have gone. My dad's not with us anymore, but she's, she's your dad will have gone because he said he'd watch anything. Any sport, it was off, so it probably went to the game. And that is an absolutely fantastic aerial picture from Bradford Industrial Museum of, of the city dog track. Virtually nothing at all remains in that picture. The ground itself is underneath um, AE Auto Parts, big office block with the rotating globe on top, uh, people remember up Legrams Lane. That's built directly on the side of the ground. And when you go up there today, the Muntas factory is on the entrance. But all that's gone, all of it. The stadium's gone, the railway line's gone. Even the uh, cutting of the railway line has been filled in. The most of the housing gone, and virtually all of the mill complexes have gone. If you just if you stand today on the on the front step of the uh, Fighting Cock pub and look down the valley, or rather up the valley towards Thornton, you're looking across the, those railway lines of where those that forest and mill chimneys are. Completely changed landscape. Quite amazing what's happened. But I don't uh, find it anyway. The Yorkshire League changes in 1937. It's relatively su successful first season. They bring in more professional players. So the rubber league players are basically pushed out of the way and they bring in a lot of professional players from, from um, North America, from the United States and Canada. And what that does, the un unintended consequence is, well, the, the intended consequence, it makes the games better, more professional. The unintended consequence is that the scoring rates drop off because the pitches are better. So there's less run scored. So as a spectacle to people who don't really understand the game, it becomes less appealing. So the crowds begin to drop off a bit. Dewsbury Packer game in, it hasn't made them any money. They're replaced by the York Maroons, who play at Booth and Crescent. They were, initially, the, I mentioned at the start of this, the York Rubber League Club were interested in hosting baseball. They were, but when the new club comes along, they go to Booth and Crescent. And it's probably to do with related, related um, Scarborough, just up, well, not just up the road, but Scarborough football club are obviously having baseball so I think York, have to, they've talked to York and said yeah we'll have a bit of that. And for a Yorkshire league to have a presence in, in York is, is probably a good thing as well. So the league changes in 1937 as I said. Um, but baseball's overstretched itself. There's a professional league in London, there's a professional league in Lancashire and there's a professional league in Yorkshire. There aren't enough players. By 1937 the only professional league left is, is Yorkshire. There's not enough players. It sucks, it sucks the, the, the talent. That's why they have to bring people across from America. And it causes a lot of problems. So by 1938, the London League becomes semi-pro and they merge the Yorkshire and Lancashire leagues together and cut down the number of clubs. And so they're trying to, you know, try, trying to get the best product they possibly can find. So they'll, they launched the Yorkshire, Lancashire and Yorkshire Major League in 1938 uh, again, excellent programme cover, and it shows the spread of clubs that are in this new league, who are Liverpool, Bolton, Oldham, Rochdale, Halifax, Bradford, Leeds, Sheffield, York and Hull. And so it's, it's almost like an M62 game, isn't it? It's, it's almost like M62 in 1938, but it's very much a trans game. Bit of light-hearted stuff here. This is the inside of the programme, actually. This is uh, Halifax against Bradford. Halifax a new club, the play at the Shea, by the way at the football ground. Um, some great adverts, by the way. Keith needs to pay attention. Uh, Jubilee Milk Stout, the best drink, the most popular drink of the North. And um, next to it is the Grosvenor Hotel in Hull, which has a large room for smoking constants. So there you go, Keith. Um, smoking constants in Jubilee Milk Stout, please. It's a guaranteed winner. Another uh, mildly amusing. This is uh, Yorkshire Major League in 1939. A programme from Hull, this is possibles against probables, and somebody's already laughing and spotted this one. There's a company in Hull, apparently, called the Asbestos and Rubber Company, who make asbestos and rubber. But they decided to go on into menswear. <laughs> and they opened a shop in Hull City Centre, and the Dutch changed the name, so you can go and buy a coat from a, something called asbestos. I don't know. 
keeps out the weather and keeps, you know, in the event of fire. Um, you can probably find out, you know, it's a bit bizarre. Anyway, there we go. Smoking concerts. Right, next card. This is, uh, so Greenfield, the player two seasons at Greenfield, and for reasons I've not found out yet, they move to uh, Parry Lane, which, is, which was the home of Bradford Rovers Football Club, and until very recently was the home of West Bowling Amateur Rugby League Club. Um, that's a picture from a great result there, Bradford 6, Leeds 0. You like that? Hey. From Parry Lane in 1939, that's apparently one of the Bradford players uh, at, the, at, at the base. Um, I can tell I don't know my baseball left. I'm not sure. That's a pause there, I don't know. Oh, God. So, thank you. I can send you that, man. I'm not emailing the picture. So it's a great picture. So, but the war comes along. By 1939, of course, the war's coming. Nobody knows it at this point, but they do by this point. Because on the 5th of August 1939, the last professional baseball game in Yorkshire, to date, you never know, it might change, is played at the Shea between Halifax and Rochdale in the National Baseball Association Challenge Cup final. 6,000 people turn up. It's a good crowd. You know, it's a good crowd. I guess the Challenge Cup final would be like all the baseball enthusiasts from all over the North England would have gathered for that game. And with war clans, you know, within a month we were at war with Germany, weren't we? So war clans are on the horizon. And the game doesn't survive. It doesn't survive the war in a professional sense. It doesn't survive the war. Six years is a long time. People get older, enthusiasm spared when you come back. A place like Bradford, for example, has got such a strong cricket culture, it's probably just easier to drop into playing cricket for Great Horn than trying to set up a new game. And John Moore's a bit sort of lost in enthusiasm as well. However, there is an amateur game. And this is a really interesting part of it. I think it's the best, most interesting part. So in York, in Leeds, in Bradford, in Sheffield and Hull, amateur league set up. In Bradford, there's a 10-team amateur league. It's virtually all based around work first facilities, apart from one, the Bradford M Men. The Bradford M Men. Any ideas? No. Morrison's. Mor <laughs> <laughs> Mormons. <laughs> well, so these are Mormon missionaries who have come to Bradford. There's a whole M men, there's a Leeds M men, there's a Bradford M men. And, and then, surprisingly, they do very well in this league. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, probably. And they're all based around works teams mainly. There's Butterfields up there, there's um, English Electric, the big uh, massive works at Form, but they have a women's team as well. So there's a small women's section. Um, there's two at Greenfield, there's one at City Sox, and there's a women's section at English Electric. I think the women's sections are probably reflective of, in the 1930s, there's an awful lot of workplace provision for sport. Hell of a lot. Manning and Mills, massive one. Blisters Mill. You think about today, Campion FC and Manning and Mills Cricket Club. They play on the on form for sports facilities of Blisters Mill. So English Electric had an enormous sports, uh, sports uh, centre as well. And I think as well, baseball probably found an easy, a good home at these places because a multi-sport works place uh, sporting section is probably going to be more open to new games. They don't face the same cultural um, fences that they might face if they went to say, I don't know, Great Harden Cricket Club, this is, can we play on your field? Oh, 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 oh. So, individuals are important. There's a chap called John Rigby. You can't see him, but he's there. John Rigby has presented the Rigby Shield to Bolton to win the 1938 Rigby Trophy. It's the amateur, Bradford Amateur League. He's also the head of amateur baseball in Yorkshire. He's also the owner of Rigby's Wireworks at Lobo. And he has his own baseball section set up there. So again, about the importance of individuals, small numbers of people who make a massive difference to this, to this game with very, very shallow roots. The other city where um, amateur baseball really gets a hold is Hull. This is enormous in Hull. In 1939, there are 28 amateur teams playing in four divisions. There are four women's teams and an 18 team school section. This is enormous. It's absolutely massive. They even start, even though the war starts, they, they carry on. The 1940 league starts, but has to stop because of the bombing of Hull. For the Luftwaffe, finding Hull's dead easy, isn't it? You come across from occupied Europe, you find the River Humber, and there's the city of Hull. And the city of Hull is the most bombed city in Britain in the Second World War. So obviously the league gets stopped and you can't see it, but on this 1937 official handbook written in the top corner, 
it says, found in Regent Street after the Blitz of 1941. A wonderful piece of history. And Hull, by the way, and um, are you listening, Bradford? Hull has a Hull History Centre, which is a collaboration between the university and the town council. It's a purpose-built, beautiful piece of architecture, a heritage centre, and it's wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. And they allow me to use these, um, these images, by the way. So hats off to Hull, well done. So Hull Baseball carries on after the war. And I think that's due to the, you know, I talked about the depth of, of baseball in Hull. They, they, in fact, they're very quick off the mark. Less than eight weeks after the German defeat, they launch a victory emergency league. And by 1948, they're back to a 16 team league. In 1949, that's shown by four women's teams. And there's a great quote out there that um, the whole baseball league is essentially an industrial directory of local firms, and it really is. It really is all about workplace provision. Such is the enthusiasm for the game, they even launched the whole baseball gazette, which is essentially a little fanzine that's produced for two seasons. You know, people trying to you know, get the league really going. However, even in Hull, in the 1950s, there are concerns about the fact that the average age of the players is 28. Now, it doesn't take a mathematical genius to work out that these players would have been very young children when the professional games got going. And these are the people who were probably infused by the professional game in Hull. And the problem they were having was passing on this enthusiasm to the next generation. The other problem in Hull was the most heavily bombed city in Britain was being massively rebuilt. So it's a real problem. It's a problem getting equipment across from the United States because there are import restrictions in place during, after, in the post-war period. And the city has been constantly rebuilt. So finding home grounds is a problem. A lot of the industry has been badly damaged. So again, trying to reset, restart, when a business might be more concerned with rebuilding the factory than rebuilding the works facilities, you can see the problems that can happen. And, and there is, it's a long, slow death, but it is a long, slow death. It's a fantastic picture of Hull Electricity. There's some great names in the Hull League. Um, East Hull Firms is my, uh, <laughs> T-H-E-R-M-S, not firms. Um, there's some fantastic names, there really are. It, it wants a lot more research into does the whole amateur baseball league because it's just enormous. And it carries on, but it begins to recede. We get to 1950, there's 18 teams in, in three divisions. Wrong thing. Wrong thing. Here we go. 1966, there's the problems that happened. The Hull Aces win the British Baseball League. And they have to, they, well they don't have to, but they qualify for a European competition which is taking place in Belgium. Not far from, but you think it'd be dead easy to get to, wouldn't it? Straight there on a boat. But they have massive problems, they have to raise 500 pounds, they write to 100 companies and they get 20 quid. 20 quid. <laughs> so you can see the games in, in, having problems. By 1986, there's a Humberside League, but it takes in much more than just the city of Hull itself. There's only eight teams in that. So it's receding quickly. By the 1990s, it's been said there's been a, there's a loss of a major sponsorship deal for British baseball nationally. There is a fracture between Hull, London, and other other places that are playing it, and people tend to concentrate on their little parts of the world rather than working together. There's a real problem. But as a historian, I don't have to worry about all these things that are happening now. And the game's still going in 2023. There's Hull Scorpions are still are still trundling away, and they've got a really good understanding of their heritage. Their website is really aware of the deep history of baseball in Hull, and they're starting a Hull baseball archive as well. And um, so fair play to them, no, they really are. They're, they really are aware of it, and they're aware of Hull's really important place in the part of British baseball. And today, coming right up to date, probably throw this away now, <laughs> the London series, of course, has been in your television screens. And it's where the Major League Baseball brings a couple of teams to West Ham's London Stadium or the Olympic Stadium and play an exhibition game. But the issue is, what happens when the circus leaves town? What's the legacy? And that's, I guess, will the Major League Baseball become the John Moores of the 21st century? I don't know. As a historian, I don't have to worry about these things, do I? Just <laughs> looking backwards. So it's interesting. So just to sum up, Bradford has this initial surge of interest but the war eventually kills the game. In Hull it doesn't, why doesn't it? I don't really know the answer to that, to be honest with you. I'm guessing, and I am guessing, that Hull's a port city. It's got more of a, a port city outlook on the world. Hull is relatively a long way from everywhere in, in Yorkshire. To play a game in 
from to play a game of baseball in Bradford from Hull, you've got to get from Hull to Bradford, play the game, and get back again. And to take all that time is difficult. So the relative geography of Hull, I think, means it, it tends to look in on itself, which is a bit of a contradiction to say it's an outlooking port city, but I think you, do, you know where I'm going with this. So I think it kind of looks in itself. There's also this fracture of baseball I just talked about where, where the game breaks up across the country, it doesn't really work together as a whole, it's caused it a problem. And it'll be interesting to see where things go in the future. But I hope that you've learned something today. I've really enjoyed um, researching this, um, this whole project. I said my daughter is in New York now, so I'm looking, my, my uh, son in law's a, a, a big baseball fan, so I'm looking forward to going across there and perhaps trying to find a little bit more about the links between William McGregor, in particular, and the start of the Football League and baseball. So I think there's, a, there's really something there in that one. And the other thing I think that somebody from Hull should pick up and run with this. Um, you know, a bit more research into the into the amateur leagues. You, and I might even do that in Bradford because I think the workplace provision angle is really, really interesting. Anyway, there we go. Thank you. I didn't I didn't know any of that. Oh, that's all right. Which is kind of the uh, point. I'll probably ask Jess eh? So, um, thank you very much, Dave. The next Sporting Lunchtime Lecture is uh, Saturday the 9th of December before um, Salford. whoever... Salford. Salford. Yeah. Before the Salford match. Yeah, who, uh... And it is uh, Dr. Peter Watson, uh, Colo Colo and the Coup, Football in Chile in 1973 and under Pinochet. So a bit of, a bit of, a bit of light-hearted, <laughs> light-hearted pre-match entertainment just to get the day off. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Cheers, Dave. For once, I'll give it to Dave another applause. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I should give another plug. So as part of our ninth birthday, uh, we've got uh, Bob Stanley from St Etienne DJ tonight, along with Gus Boosfield, who played last night, and we've got our special record cafe uh, birthday beer that we brewed ourselves. That's on the bar now on Pub One. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.